Okay, cool. Oh, and welcome, Scott. So I'll just introduce you to the other faculty. Scott Beamer's here now, too. Scott is Ping. Hello, hi. Hello, nice to meet you. Okay, well, I'll get started uh, then. Um, so it's my pleasure to in introduce our speaker today, uh, Yiping Hong. So I know Yiping because him and I were both postdocs at Princeton. We sat in the same room, um, although we worked on very different things. So Yiping was working behind me on um, sort of quantum computing and sort of the hardware software interfaces for that, um, while I was working on more of kind of classic architecture. But, you know, just from sitting close together, being in the same group, we both worked with Professor uh, Margaret Martinosi. And if you know, she sort of does a little bit of both quantum and classical. And so, you know, I got exposed to this sort of work that Yiping was working on. And, you know, it's, it's just fascinating. Everybody's kind of interested in quantum and its potentials and its challenges and its difficulties and, and being sort of that close to the work that Yiping was doing, especially from sort of a computer science point of view, really helped me appreciate this, this area in, in sort of a very kind of deep way. And so I always found that Yiping gave very, very good talks and he made this uh, topic very approachable, which can, I know, be quite difficult sometimes. So hopefully I'm not setting the bar too high, Yiping, but oh, well, I know I'm not because I've seen all of your talks. So um, without further ado, let's, let's uh, welcome Yiping. All right, thanks Tyler for the introduction. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so as Tyler mentioned, this is a exciting time to be working on quantum computing, right? So for a very long time, we've known that there are potentially algorithms based on quantum computers that can do fascinating things like factoring the integers better than any known classical algorithm. Uh, more realistically, they'll probably have applications in uh, simulating systems where quantum mechanics play a role. Uh, and it's kind of a important point right now too, as a lot of algorithmists are coming up with more and more algorithms by the day. The other part that makes this field super interesting to be working in right now is uh, kind of surprisingly, and it's a very strange coincidence, we've got two types of very different device technologies now vying to be the first useful quantum computers. Uh, these are being pioneered by companies like IBM, Google, uh, Honeywell, uh, IMQ, and at UMD, for example. And with these prototypes, uh, we're starting to realize, well, uh, if we want to fill out the whole uh, computer system stack from algorithms through programming languages, through simulators, through debuggers, through architecture and microarchitecture, we need to do a lot of uh, uh, what is considered systems work. Uh, and so here in this talk, what I'm trying to, uh, trying to uh, introduce is some of my ideas and work in using different types of abstractions, different mathematical models to describe what quantum computer programs are and how those models would help us uh, reason and simulate these algorithms better than conventional approaches. All right, so we'll move on to the next slide here and you know, feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, I wanna make sure that we, uh, we keep people you know, following along and feel free to also use the chat box if, you, if that helps kind of um, put the question uh, in. All right, so this talk is gonna have some key ideas. Um, so the key idea is that we can actually borrow some techniques from classical AI, right? So these are techniques that were built for reasoning about probabilistic models of the world. And their mechanics are excellent abstractions for quantum computing, both in the sense that quantum computing itself deals with kind of probabilistic outcomes, but also in quantum computing, we have events, undesirable events such as noise that are themselves also probabilistic, right? So things that they built for AI, like graphical models, including things like Bayesian networks, Markov networks, these play a role in helping us simulate and represent quantum circuits, quantum computer programs. Uh, and then kind of further deeper down, uh, once you have this translation, you can start to borrow some of the machinery that they did for uh, classical AI in the form of compilation of the 
uh, graphical models, manipulating, the, ma manipulating them, wrangling them. And these help us get interesting results working with quantum algorithms. So such as simulating the algorithm's outputs uh, and shrinking the representations down, for example. So on the bottom here, I kind of have some of the cartoons of some of the translations we'll go through. And uh, while we're on each stage, I also talk about how uh, some of my ideas of where I might be able to push these ideas going forward. So here's our step-by-step -step outline. Um, so the first chapter here is going to be a kind of motivation for the types of workloads that we study. This should also be helpful for those who are still trying to get a heads and tails of quantum computing, what might they be useful for in the near term. The second chapter is gonna talk about a little bit about um, how quantum computer programs work and what are the existing techniques and why might they be insufficient. And finally, the last chapter here, this is going to be about uh, our ideas on new representations for, algorithm, for quantum algorithms. All right, so first let's talk about what types of workloads we should focus on in the near term, right? So what these are the workloads that I think are particularly interesting because these are workloads that quantum systems researchers think should be useful and more realistic in the near term. And they're realistic because they fit on the kinds of quantum computers that we have in the near term. So near term quantum computers, they're kind of puny, right? So uh, in terms of the number of devices, the physical widgets that represent the fundamental pieces of information, we've got maybe a hundred of them, right? So this is minuscule compared to the billion transistors that we have on CPUs, for example. And so that's the limitation in capacity. And secondarily, they're also limited in terms of their reliability, right? So this is that uh, these operations on the delicate quantum states, the states themselves are susceptible to decay and noise. Uh, and then also the kinds of operations that you wanna apply on those qubit states, those quantum states, uh, they themselves are also not as precise as we wish. And in the long run, people think that, well, we can build uh, quantum computers that overcome these problems in the states decaying away and also the states not having precise enough operations in the sense that there is also error correction that you could do on quantum states, just like there are error correction protocols like Bole codes for classical computing, but that's just too far in the future. It's not available in the internet term. So given those, restrictions given those constraints in the near term. The kinds of algorithms that we'll be studying soon are going to be these variational algorithms. All right, so these very variational algorithms, they essentially are uh, algorithms that involve both quantum and classical co-computation, -co cooperation, where uh, in this picture, I'm borrowing from a seminal work on this area. Uh, the, it illustrates the idea. The key idea is that you use a quantum computer. The quantum computer, you set it up as a function evaluate. It's, it's quantum in the sense that it's able to represent the high dimensional uh, problem spaces that, that uh, quantum simulation problems like simulating a molecule may have, right? So you wanna use a quantum computer to do that modeling. And then in the model, you've got parameters that you want to adjust, right? So you want to adjust some parameter to optimize some function. And for that, you can use a classical computer running a optimization routine like steepest descent. The classical computer just comes up with new parameters training the quantum model. So this is almost like it's a, a neural network, but instead of having a neural network, the neural network, network itself has quantum states in it. And because they're quantum states, this is like a network that deals with complex numbers. All right. So Tyler's got a question in uh, the chat box. So Tyler asks, is this like an accelerator setup? 
yeah, so this is this is the key idea, right? So quantum computers uh, are always going to be accelerators, right? So they're never going to be general purpose uh, computing devices, uh, but instead they're usually going to be, they're almost certainly going to be geared for doing very specific tasks. So here the specific task is, is modeling a quantum system. You use the quantum computer as a model for uh, a system that follows Schrodinger's equation, for example. Uh, so the quantum computer serves as a coprocessor, as an accelerator for a classical computer. Okay, so, all right. Um, we'll skip over this slide. All right, so those are the types of quantum algorithms I think we should be interested in, in the near term. Uh, and so uh, we want to build out some of the tools and techniques like reasoning about them, representing them, uh, and simulating them so that we could uh, improve on, upon them. And the reason that simulators and these models are important for quantum computing, it's the exact same reason that we use simulators and models for classical computers, right? So uh, in classical computing, uh, half the battle is to create a good simulator that allows us to reason about the next generation of algorithms and hardware and architectures. It's the same thing for quantum computers. We want to have simulators that can simulate the next generation of quantum algorithms and quantum computers running those algorithms. And for the time being, that means that we're trying to use a classical computer to simulate a quantum system. And so trying to do that well is a very important building block and very important tool that we need to create, we need to, create to be able to do this kind of iteration. So I already motivated why variational algorithms are important, right? And so some of the key traits of variational algorithms, the reason that they work well on the quantum computers that we'll have in the near term, it's due to some of these, these aspects, right? So one aspect is that the quantum computer that runs the variational algorithm, it itself is noisy. And so you want to simulate the noisy behavior of the quantum computer. This means that you want to simulate the quantum state and have also some model of incorrect events happening in the quantum computer. And so you wanna simulate that noise. Second, one of the ways that variational algorithms can be useful in the near term is you get this chance to run the quantum computer many times and try the simulation with different parameters, right? So, this is also a unique trait of variational algorithms that might not be true with kind of the other algorithms that, that, um, that we might use in the long term. And finally, the last aspect is that instead of uh, trying to get the whole description of the quantum computer program state, ultimately what you want to obtain from the quantum computer when you're doing these variation algorithms is you only want to draw a sample from the final distribution, right? So the final distribution may have some, some high probability outcomes and low probability outcomes. You don't really care about the whole distribution. You just want to be able to draw samples from that outcome so that you're getting more of the more likely outcomes in the same way that a quantum computer would give you those more likely outcomes. Okay, so... Uh, I'll pause here a little bit. This, these are the traits that we wanna, that we want to be able to capture in any system that we think of, that we dream of to reason about quantum computers. These are, I think, the important traits that we need to um, address. Okay. So what I'll do next is let's talk a little bit about um, what are the existing approaches, right? So what are the existing models, existing representations for quantum programs? And do they do these things? Do they, do they demonstrate these traits, right? So the most basic and common, the first level representation 
of quantum algorithms, how we calculate them and how we simulate them is what's called the Schrodinger simulation. All right, so let's talk about what the Schrodinger simulation is. The Schrodinger simulation is what we learn when we study quantum computing 101. This is, you've got a quantum circuit. Quantum circuits have qubit states. The circuit has gates in them that work on the qubit states. Sometimes these gates work on one qubit. Sometimes they work on two qubits. And the mathematics of what this picture shows is basically a matrix vector multiplication, right? So the qubit gates, they're matrices. Uh, the qubit states, they're vectors. And when you apply a operation onto a qubit state, you may multiply the matrix against the vector, right? So if you want to, if I gave you this quantum circuit and I ask you, so what's the final state of this? then this is how you would do the, do the matrix vector multiplication. And so we can think about, okay, well, so in this viewpoint, does it do, does it allow us to address those challenges that surround variational algorithms, right? So variational algorithms, typically they've got a lot of qubits, but you don't do a lot of operations on them. And this is one of the downsides of this representation, right? The downside here is to represent the whole qubit state across all the qubits, the amount of memory it takes to represent the state of the quantum computer grows exponentially. And so in that sense, this representation kind of inhibits our way or our ability to reason about variational algorithms. Number two, uh, so second property here is Remember in variational algorithms, we want to try the simulation and try running it multiple times with, with different parameters. So you want to somehow realize that you're doing that. You want to have some kind of compilation to, to get at the essence of the circuit so that you can just plug in new parameters and get new, result, get new results for each parameter set. And this viewpoint also prohibits from us from, from, from thinking about that. What it does allow though, is once you get the whole state vector, once you have the full description of the quantum program state, it does allow you to nicely draw samples from it. So in that sense, this is nicely geared to that. Okay, so this is kind of the evaluation strengths and weaknesses of this style of reasoning about and simulating quantum programs. Um, Tyler's got a question here in the simulator. Is the final state a probability distribution or is it a set of concrete values sampled from a probably probability distribution? Yeah, so uh, in the simulator, in the simulator, the final state is essentially what's the final state at the end of the quantum program. And this is a state vector. So the state vector looks like this. It's got, in general, complex values in it. Inside the vector, we have these things called amplitudes. And uh, essentially, this is what we want to calculate, right? What's the amplitudes of each possibility at the end of the quantum simulation? And uh, what are the large magnitude amplitude components of that vector? So this is what I mean by probability distribution. Um, and what we want to try to do is let's try to draw samples from that distribution. All right. Okay. So there's also another viewpoint, right? So there's a lot of different viewpoints in quantum computing uh, and different ways to reason about things. Another important one is called Feynman simulation. And here in this one, what they do is they take a quantum circuit and they start to draw things like graphical models. Right, so this is kind of a translation of what that might look like. Uh, it's not as important to know the full details here, but essentially we got the quantum circuit that becomes a AI graphical model. In the graphical model, we've got the gates, right? So we've taken those matrices that represent the gates, these become tensors and the tensors what they do is they describe the relationship between one possibility, one, one set of assignments to the next set of assignments. 
And in this model, right, so this is a AI kind of model called tensor networks. In tensor networks, there's this operation where you can take two tensors and you can combine them, right? So in this top graph here, you can wrangle it. You can take two nodes and merge them together. And the way you do that merging is you look at these two tables, these two tensors, and you look at the likewise indices and you multiply them together. Right, so in this viewpoint, this allows you to more easily do this type of manipulation and also allows you to do other types of um, uh, other types of inference or calculations easily as well. So if you think about what are the strengths and weaknesses of this model, it's got other kinds of strengths and weaknesses. So here, for example, in contrast to the Schrodinger view, this viewpoint allows you to very nicely simulate circuits with a lot of qubits. But instead of getting the whole distribution, what you're able to do is you get to calculate one amplitude at a time, right? So what is the amplitude of this possibility and this possibility and so forth? Uh, and potentially also this, this, this other viewpoint, it also allows you to do a kind of wrangling where you can look at the structure first and then plug in different parameters later on, All right? So this is the point of this is that existing techniques the particularly important ones like Schrodinger and Feynman representations, they've got strengths and weaknesses. And we want what we want is a new way of representing quantum programs that maybe potentially has all the strengths of this, hopefully. All right, so I think I think like the the key point is that you know we we're trying to come up with a new direction and a new way to represent circuits, quantum programs that may offer different types of um, strengths. All right, so uh, I'll pause here before kind of moving on to the next chapter. Hey, I have a question, Yifei. I figure it's, yeah. it might be easier just to say it rather than type it, but uh, mm -hmm. especially with your pausing. Um, when you talk about these tensor operations, um, how big are they? Can they be like accelerated? Like if you have a, a SIMD optim optimized architecture, like a GPU, could you, like, are these tensors that you're combining big enough to be optimized when you're simulating them or are they kind of just a bunch of small tensors? So, um, so typically these are small tensors. You want to keep them small, right? So in this viewpoint, uh, you want to somehow do like kind of op almost, it's almost like an optimal, optimal matrix multiplication, dynamic programming kind of a thing, where you've got this big network of tensors and uh, you want to keep shrinking them, but you want to avoid doing the hardest work, right? So you actually want to avoid end up ending up with two giant tensors that you somehow got to slam together. And so there are these techniques that basically emphasize on reducing the tree width very carefully kind of picking which ones to merge so that at any given moment, the tree width doesn't blow up. And so in that viewpoint, that's, that's generally you don't actually have huge tensors. Um, you ask about SIMD, right? So you ask about SIMD, where SIMD and GPU often comes in is through these types of calculations where you do the matrix vector multiplication or the matrix matrix multiplication. And here SIMD shines more. Uh, where you kind of, you got parallelism. So let's do what parallelism is good at. Very cool. I mean, uh, I mean, just a quick question on this. Have people built accelerators for simulating quantum? Um, yeah, so there's, uh, there are a couple important lines of work. So GPU-based simulators um, include, include Quest. Right, so this is one such um, GPU-based simulator for quantum circuits. Uh, recently in ICS 2021, uh, a couple months ago, three or four months ago, there was also a new paper called High, High Quest, High, yeah, High, uh, High, High Qual, which is also a new effort in GPU-based simulation. Uh, other efforts, focus on kind of large supercomputers. So large network clusters of high performance 
CPUs to do the simulation. Cool, thanks. Okay, so now the interesting part, right? So these are some of the, what, what I'm gonna show you next is a new set of representations based on graphical models and based on logical formulas as a new way to represent quantum programs and to reason about them, to represent different things and to uh, simulate them. So the structure of this is like this. So we've got several steps. Uh, I'm gonna focus mostly on the first step here, right? So the idea here is we take quantum circuits and we can convert them to AI graphical models like Bayesian networks. And once you've got that translation, uh, there are very cool techniques from AI, from classical AI where they compile the representations and turn them into uh, logical representations, these objects that allow for easy, more easy kind of queries and sampling. Uh, and so that's exactly what we, what we pursue. We, we come up with a correct mapping of noisy quantum circuits. We turn them into graphical models. And then we use the AI machinery uh, for inference to show that we can get correct results. And then we compare those uh, simulation performance against um, known existing techniques. Uh, and what's nice about this is this, this, this series of translations, they allow us to tackle the kind of key properties of variational algorithms that I mentioned before. So remember, remember variational algorithms are what are the important workloads for the near term, they've got special traits. And these translation steps allow us to meet the needs of those traits. So first let's talk about turning uh, noisy quantum circuits into graphical models into Bayesian networks. So first of all, what's a, what's a Bayesian network? All right, so a Bayesian network comes from uh, classical AI. It's a model that represents our probabilistic understanding of the world. So this is, this is the canonical textbook example of a, a Bayesian network. Right, it answers, um, we have this, this, this model of how different uh, events, raining, the sprinkler being on, and the grass being wet, we have a model of how causally one event influences the next event. And these are not deterministic, these are not deterministic events, but instead they kind of tell, update the probabilities of each of them happening. So for example, this edge here between rain and sprinkler, it says that uh, you know, we have some knowledge of the probability of it raining, 20% chance it may rain. And depending on if it rains, the probability of the sprinkler turning on, let's assume the sprinkler has some kind of rain sensing capability, the rain happening or not influences the probability of the sprinklers turning on or not. And these events, sprinkler and rain, both then go on to influence whether or not the grass is wet. So this is a very nice model. You know, this is ancient at this point. Um, I continue to find these models exciting as I think there's a lot of tools and knowledge and wisdom in, in these models that, that the kinds of uh, trained models that we study now completely ignore. Right, so we don't have to train for some human knowledge about these causal causations. Oftentimes, you can construct the models, and that aids with the training, or that aids in the modeling of the world. So here, I'm going to borrow these ancient Bayesian networks, and now I'm going to apply them to representing quantum circuits. Okay, so this quantum circuit is here. We've got the quantum circuit that we had before. Uh, I've added a new cast of characters here. This is a, a GAD, it's a generalized amplitude damping. And what it does is it models some kind of noise event. So it models whether or not uh, a, a qubit state has decayed from the one state to the zero state. So its energy has dissipated, causing error. And so this is, 
the translation, an example of the translation from a quantum circuit into a Bayesian network. And what I'm representing in the Bayesian network is I've got the qubit states at each moment in time. Right, so the Q0s indicate which qubits we're talking about. The M indices indicate at what time point we are in the, in the quantum circuit. And we can describe the causal relationships between one qubit state and its dependencies by connecting them with directed edges. And inside each node, I've got a table, right? So in the Bayesian network, this would have been what's called a conditional probability table. Here, this is a conditional amplitude table. The values come from the matrices that would have described what these gate operations are. So we translated that part. And the other thing we can translate and model is noise events, right? So here, I've got random variables that indicate whether or not noise is happening. And we can also model exactly what those noise events do to the quantum state, All right? So in this nice graphical language, I've captured both the quantum states, the gates, how they work on the quantum states. And I've also captured um, uh, noise events and the probabilities that describe whether or not those noise events happen. And this is, this is a neat idea. Uh, and I'll take an aside here to, uh, to kind of talk about like where this might even go, right? So uh, I will then kind of transition over to this slide, a set of notes that uh, a uh, undergraduate senior, so Ham Palandi is working with me as an independent study project. And what he and his team are working with me on is whether or not graphical models can help us understand some types of noise that the, the existing languages just don't even describe, right? So, so here we've got a qubit state, right? So this is two qubits. The two qubits, they go through uh, noise models. These are called bit flip noises. And what bit flip noise does is it takes the zero state, turns it to the one state, and it takes the one state and turns it to the zero state. It's parameter, per, parameterized by a probability, P in this case equals 0 0.1, that says with probability 10%, this noise will happen, all right? And this is the existing kind of textbook language that we have to describe noise. Uh, and so we can work through the mathematics of this noise happening uh, we create, we get these things called mixed quantum states. These are probabilistic mixtures of quantum states. And we can describe those states with density matrices, which are this nice packaged representation that captures that distribution of the classical noise probabilities and the quantum states, right? And so this shows that we've got the existing language and machinery that allows us to represent and reason about noise in this sense. Okay, so now here's the tricky part, right? So in this model, the event, the, the probability of this happening and this happening, these two events were modeled previously as independent, right? So here they're independent. Independent meaning that uh, the probability of both noise events happening should be the probability, the probabilities multiplied together. So P of A and B happening is going to be P A times P B. This is the kind of assumption that we always work with uh, in existing density matrix noise channel models. And this is fine, right? So we've gotten a lot of analysis of noisy quantum circuits done this way. Uh, but one of the kind of the open problems in quantum prototype uh, and quantum systems is these noise events are not are not independent. They're correlated. What that, what that means is the probability of A and B happening of both both the flip events happening is not going to be the simple product of these two events happening independently. So P of A and B happening is not going to be 
PA times PB, right? So this completely breaks the existing language and mathematics that we can use to describe uh, quantum noise. And for, what's neat here is, well, it's very natural to model something like that in, in graphical models. I just add another node that represents a different coin toss and that node influences two states at once. And this would be the ideal kind of language and machinery to describe correlated events. Right, so this is kind of a side for me to kind of talk about where, where I think this is going. All right, so any questions so far up to this point? This is the idea of taking quantum circuits and turning them into graphical models, which are nice because they model noise events and they also potentially even model correlated noise events. So Yiping, do you have like a compiler that goes from quantum circuits to these graphical models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we built out in this tool chain, right? So we've taken, we built a compiler built inside Google CERC that takes Google CERC, which is a open source quantum experimentation framework. And we can take those programs and we can turn them into uh, standard Bayesian network listings, net lists or no, yeah, descriptions. So we've got that compiler built. And then the next part is kind of this, this processing step, right? So we've got the Bayesian network describing the quantum networks, quantum circuits, and there's even more translations we can do. So one approach in classical AI is they can go from Bayesian networks, graphical models, and turn them into logical formulas. And so these logical formulas are things like conjunctive normal forms, arithmetic circuits. And what these compilation steps do is they take the network representation and they turn them into uh, formulas that you can process using satisfiability methods and you know, do inference based on the compiled results. So the next few slides is gonna talk about how we borrow the AI machinery to do this kind of wrangling and to do this type of compilation. Okay, so this is kind of part two, right? So first I showed you how quantum circuits can become a graphical model. Here, I'm gonna show you how a graphical model representing a quantum circuit can turn into a satisfiability equation, some, a satisfiability problem. And the way we do that is you look at the qubit states and the semantics of what these nodes and edges mean, they've also got a logical formula representation, right? So the qubit state of Q0, the qubit zero and moment zero, it's gonna take on two possibilities. Cat zero, the zero state, or cat one, the one state. And these are complementary to each other, right? So uh, these, this, this sentence here describes that these are opposite kinds of um, orthogonal states that they can take on. And we can write down this set of clauses. We can also write down other clauses that uh, describe other parts of the semantics. So here I'm looking at the Hadamard. So this is the uh, qubit state on qubit zero at moment one, which comes from qubit zero going through Hadamard and what's its state at that point. And the semantics of this gate itself can also be translated into a kind of logical formula. So the logical formula says, hey, if qubit zero at moment zero is zero and also the cube and the moment uh, one, qubit zero at moment one is also zero, then that raises a indicator variable, adding a kind of uh, coefficient to this possibility, right? So in, in classical AI, this, these would have been probabilities that they work with here. Here we're working with amplitudes. And this is the way where we can take a graphical model and turn it into uh, a logical formula. So the next step essentially, you look at the Bayesian network, you look at the semantics of every single node, 
write down all of the sentences describing each of those sentence, each of those uh, semantics, and you combine them into one large logical formula that we can work with using satisfiability methods. This is something that was standard in, in classical AI. Here, we're showing that this also works for, for quantum computing, for quantum, um, quantum circuits and uh, graphical models representing quantum circuits. Okay, so let me pause there before kind of moving on. So the significance of this, the significance of this is we're taking something that was you know, quantum circuits, right? Before we always just thought about them as matrices and vectors. Here, this work shows that we can think about them using other models. And here, this includes graphical models and logical formulas. So there's more compilation we can do. This is again, borrowing the machinery of classical AI. Uh, one type of manipulation that this allows us to do is we can take the uh, logical formula representation, the naive representation, if you just like combined all the, all the clauses together and led and ended up with a big giant uh, CNF, we can use satisfiability techniques to shrink that representation down. So this here, what they're doing is they're looking at deterministic events. They're looking at the sparsity, they're looking at the zeros and ones in them, and they're combining them so that the representation shrinks down. So here I'm showing kind of a naive compilation with no optimizations turned on and a optimized representation with some of this determinism and structure being extracted out and compiled away. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing that this works to actually crunch down different algorithms. So I'm plotting the naive representation versus kind of, uh, I'm, I'm plotting, the, rep the representation size of the naive representation versus a compiled down representation. And we are seeing that it's able to extract different amounts of structure and determinism for different algorithms. So it's able to see the structure in these quantum circuits and come up with more reduced representations of them. Okay. So with that compilation, we've got this data structure. It's in general, a DAG uh, directed acyclic graph. And this makes it so that doing some of these queries, inferences, sampling become graph traversal. So here, uh, you know, recall what we were trying to do in the first place before we launched into this, 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 um, this rabbit hole of different representations. The original task that we set out to do was we want to simulate the outcomes of the quantum program. Well, here, the calculation of those outcomes becomes a task of tree traversal. So the way you would use a representation like this is you look at the compiled representation. And inside of this representation, you've got these nodes, these leaves called indicator variables that have a truth value. So for example, a truth value here would be, is the state of qubit zero at moment two, is it in the zero state? And it's got a truth variable to it. And so to query this model, you would assign these variables, the possibility, the, the a determined uh, set of variable assignments. And then you basically run the tree, right? So you, the tree has also got these uh, operations in them, multiplies and adds, and you follow its directions of what calculation to do between its branches and arrive at the value at the root node. And this root node is going to be the amplitude, the probability amplitude of that assignment. All right, so here what I'm saying is, what it's showing is, suppose that the random variable saying that the noise at moment two on qubit zero did happen is true. Then what is the amplitude? What is the probability amplitude of the final state being one one? And 
by using this tree, this um, DAG, it will tell you the amplitude for that is this number here. All right, so you can use this kind of traverse it many times and get the simulation outcomes. And we show that it works. So let's just take a step back, right? So recall, just like, let's appreciate just how different this approach is to kind of the existing techniques. You know, other techniques would have relied on uh, matrix vector multiplication or combining tensors. Here, it's a very different representation that potentially has been shrunk down. And also the other nice thing here is this allows for lazy evaluation, right? So suppose what you wanna do now is, okay, I found the amplitude for one one. What is the amplitude for one zero? Well, you change that one indicator variable and only some of the nodes and branches will change. And it can then tell you what's the amplitude of that that alternative, that other assignment and variables. Okay, any questions so far? So now the question is, okay, so we've got all these translations, we've gone from quantum circuits, noisy quantum circuits to graphical models, to logical formulas and to arithmetic circuits, which we then query and sample. Uh, and uh, I submit to you that this translation allows us to address some of the key traits of variational algorithms through these translation steps. Let's talk about if it works well. Well, first result is surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, but fascinatingly, this gives you exactly the correct quantum, uh, quantum simulation outcomes, right? So we use Google CERC. We built a simulator backend for Google CERC. This backend passes all the test cases for being a quantum simulator inside Google Search's framework. And also it gives correct simulation outcomes for a wide uh, variety of quantum algorithms. So these are some of the benchmark algorithms that they have in, uh, in Google Search. And then we also compare the sampling performance uh, of our approach versus existing techniques. So our approach is in the purple line here, purple series, and the baseline comparisons that we're comparing against. One is a matrix vector multiplication based simulator in the form of QSIM. This is a simulator built by uh, Google as a backend to Google CERC. Uh, and the other baseline that we compare against is the other formalism, right? So this is one based on tensor network contraction. Uh, and this is a simulator called QTorch, where it represents the circuit as a tensor and it, com it smartly combines the tensors until we get sample outcomes. And plotting the time it takes to draw a thousand samples versus the number of qubits there are in the quantum circuit. Uh, and this is for a benchmark based on uh, QAOA, which is an important variational algorithm. So as you see, it just has completely different uh, scaling trends. It, you know, both tensor networks and, uh, and our approach don't suffer from the sheer width of the state vector as much as pure matrix vector multiplication does. And at the same time, because we're able to intelligently compile and extract structure from the quantum circuits, we're also able to um, beat the baseline based on tensor numbers. So we do that, that's for ideal circuits. And we also do the same for noisy circuits as well. So noisy circuits, this time around, we add noise to the quantum circuits so that now we have to simulate the noise effects and we show that we also are able to be a naive approach. So how many threads do, am I using? So I'm using one thread. Uh, so as it turns out, kind of traversing this graphical structure, it becomes not as easy to parallelize. This becomes more of a pointer chasing problem. 
Uh, so here I'm, I don't have any multi-threading going on. This is to answer uh, Tyler's question. Okay. So any questions up to this point before I kind of summarize and kind of point out some additional directions? Okay, so here in this talk, uh, just to recap, uh, I showed how uh, there are some existing ways to model quantum circuits based on matrix and vectors and tensor networks. And I show several new ways of representing quantum circuits and the noise effects. And I talk about how that aids in an important problem of simulating uh, the types of algorithms that um, that might be useful in the near term. Uh, so what I talked about there was work um, that was published recently at ASPOS 2021. Uh, this is collaborative work with my co-authors Stephen Holson, Todd Milstein, and Guy Van der Brock at UCLA, and also Professor Margaret Martinosi at Princeton University, who was my postdoc advisor then. Uh, so as you see. Uh, this is, there are artifacts available for this paper. And so the, the extensions to Google CERC and the extensions to the AI tools are all uh, cataloged and available for hacking. Uh, and what I want to do next is I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's the broader picture here. Um, so I've got a couple broader picture discussions here. So one possible direction is, you know, this, this, this idea of representing quantum circuits as graphical models and logical formulas, this, this joins a kind of cast of different types of representations that are all different from the naive approach of state vectors and matrices, but kind of they have interesting connections to each other. Uh, and one particularly interesting direction that I, I want to explore, and I don't even know where it might go, is there's one representation called stabilizer formalism. Well, with the stabilizer formalism, it's kind of this uh, abstract algebra representation of quantum circuits. And it shows that if the quantum circuit has certain gates and certain states in them, uh, those states and gates have a very symmetrical structure in them and makes it easy to simulate classically. And what's tricky is existing simulation techniques kind of don't recognize that at all, right? So the, the abstract algebra kind of theory of quantum circuits sits off there kind of in its own, its own territory, we know about it. But then on the other end, the major tools based on tensor networks and matrices and vectors cannot work with this kind of cool formalism whatsoever. And the way that they might be able to be joined together is in the formalism that I showed in this work, right, in, in this talk today. You know, once we have a more logical formula based representation, it may be easier to kind of bridge those two, those two um, formalisms and paradigms. That's one such direction. And the other direction, uh, Tyler kind of already mentioned too, which is um, you know, have people come up with accelerators for quantum circuit simulation? Well, sure, right? People have used GPUs and large network clusters to attack the quantum simulation problem with sheer parallelism. Well, another avenue here is now that we have these translations, these translations may allow us to piggyback of accelerator work target at, targeted at uh, these other representations too. So for example, there's inference accelerators. And since we show that quantum circuit simulation is an inference problem, maybe inference accelerators can now help with um, quantum simulation. That's another direction I'm interested in. All right, so with that, I'll uh, thank all my collaborators and. Uh, 
uh, research students uh, at Rutgers, at Yonsei, at Princeton, at UCLA. Uh, and with that, I'll take questions. Cool, thank you, Yiping. Um, as always, virtual applause is a little bit quieter than real applause, but it it is there. <laughs> um, yeah, that talk was excellent. Um, and I, I do just want to mention, especially for, I know that we did have some latecomers, um, Yiping, you know, Yiping's an assistant professor at, at Rutgers, and I believe you are recruiting for graduate students. Is that right? I know we have some undergrads in the that attend these seminars, so. Yeah, certainly um, I am. Um, yeah, come to Rutgers. Uh, we've got, We've got exciting work going on. Uh, we're building out a full-fledged uh, research group spanning all the way up from uh, theory algorithms through me, who, who I, I do systems. And we've also got uh, ECE interfacing with the hardware and physics labs building, uh, building uh, the devices. So we're building that out. Very cool. Um, so I'll, I'll moderate some questions, but just to sort of get the ball rolling, um, you know, whenever you think about simulators and when you think about building simulators that I know some people who are attending this talk work on, um, you got to think about accuracy. And so, I mean, you did a lot of work talking about sort of your mathematical models, but if you were to go to actual, actually the quantum computers that IBM have now and Google have now, how accurate are the simulators that you're building compared to the real, the real deal? Uh, so... In terms of accuracy, uh, um, it's worth pointing out basically that up to step four here, everything above this is exact. There's no, there's no inaccuracies, right? So uh, there may be inaccuracies in the form of, uh, you want to model what's the noise, right? And so this task of quantifying and characterizing the noise is a open problem. This is something that systems researchers are trying to tackle. But given whatever noise you plug into the model I propose, up to step four, you're able to get exact uh, simulation, right? Uh, it's an exact model. Uh, where some kind of the approximation comes in is in the sampling step. Uh, so remember sampling is we're trying to draw uh, samples from a distribution. The distribution is the final quantum state. And you know, here in the sampling step, uh, you know, you need a sufficient number of samples to to get a full picture of the distribution. But what it's but so so that's where some inaccuracy comes in. And essentially what you're modeling here though is still just like what the quantum computer would have done in the first place. So the quantum computer would have given you a sample with probability proportional to whatever its, its state vector inside is. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the accuracy comparison. Cool, that makes sense. Uh, does anybody else have any questions right now? I mean, maybe so I'll, I'll ask another one then along those lines. And again, this comes from sort of my experience working on the, the classical simulator that we were working on at Princeton is, you know, you worry about accuracy, but then you also worry about speed. And I know you did some, you showed some graphs that were showing how well your simulator compares to other simulators, but in terms of, you know, running this on a raw quantum computer, how, how many orders of magnitude are we slower in simulator world than we are on actual quantum computers today? Ah, okay. Well, um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, but basically, uh, um, you know, all of these classical simulators are orders and orders of magnitude slower than a qu real quantum computer would be able to do. Uh, so here, you know, we're we're spending minutes at a time trying to simulate what thirty qubits do in this in this algorithm. Uh, but you could also just get together 30 qubits and run this algorithm on the real quantum prototypes. And they'll give you those samples in a few seconds. Um, where kind of quantum versus classical becomes, you know, it's got its pros and cons is here we're simulating a idealized circuit. 
and the quantum computer is going to suffer from physical noise. Uh, and so kind of if you're asking about like at what point or what is the comparison between quantum and classical computers there, uh, you know, in, in 2020 or 20, 2019, there was a lot of back and forth between Google and IBM talking about at what point does this break even happen? And so Google was arguing that they used 57 qubits in a noisy real quantum computer. And that despite the noise that it, it, it suffers from is already doing a task that, uh, that no classical computer is able to uh, simulate. Right, so despite the quantum computer suffering noise, it's still able to surpass a classical simulation at the out at out at uh, out at the capacity of like fifty-seven qubits. Very interesting. Any other questions from the audience? I mean, I'm I'm happy to keep asking you more questions because I think this stuff is really interesting. Uh, looks like Scott might have a question. Yeah, I have a question. I guess also from the introduction, uh, you know, Tyler mentioned how he's a postdoc colleague of a quantum person. That was the same thing when I was a postdoc. My colleague was a quantum person at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Jared McLean is now doing quantum for Google. So that's kind of cool. cool. My, 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 oh, my, Jared my McLean. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but my question is actually, uh, as Tyler said, some of us do simulation uh, for classical stuff all the time, and so. Uh, you allude to a potential future direction being uh, building uh, specialized hardware to try and simulate quantum computers better. Can you comment on kind of the workload characteristics of the actual simulation you're doing, like, you know, arithmetically, what kind of operations you're doing? Yeah, so it depends a lot, right? So, so I've shown, so, so yeah, the, okay, the question here is, uh, what a, with these translations, what does the task of quantum circuit simulation actually become? Right, so it, it depends on where you want to stop. Right, so it depends on where in my proposed translations you want to tackle the problem. So if you want to follow me all the way through and work at these AC levels of arithmetic circuits, which is kind of the endpoint of of the AI techniques that compile these. This becomes a graph traversal, right? So it becomes uh, looking at a large data structure that looks like this, and looking up the uh, uh, variable assignments, looking at the coefficients that it tells you to multiply, and then do multiply and adds all the way up this this this, um, this DAG. Okay, but is, so is that, the DAG static? Uh, the structure is static, um, but the contents of the DAG will change. The, the node values would change depending on uh, what outcome you're trying to calculate. Okay, so you can imagine maybe like some sort of compiler could like take this and uh, straight line this for you, right? You'd have like the data references to pull in the new data values. But so the reason why I'm asking all these questions is very similar to what I do. I do hardware simulation where we take designs in as a graph. Mm -hmm. It's a logical network router in an arithmetic circuit, right? Or, you know, here we are trying to schedule and map that onto CPU code, right? That's kind of what I spent the last couple of years doing, but it sounds very interesting and very similar. Mm -hmm. or potentially similar. I don't know if it's actually similar, but potentially similar, I should say. Yeah, so it, I think, you know, this is, uh, you know, traversing these things is beyond my expertise. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is exactly the way, this is exactly the way, like, kind of, changing the representation that allows us to try different uh, hammers at it. Cool, cool, very interesting. Yeah, let's see, is there any more questions? Okay, if not, I know it's a little bit, it's getting late there, you paying, but um, just want to thank you again for coming. I thought this talk was excellent. I always enjoy hearing quantum talks. I think it's so interesting and, and seeing all, all the cool ideas that, that everybody's exploring. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming and we'll keep in touch. And for everybody here at Santa Cruz, we'll see everybody at the next seminar in a week. All right, thanks Tyler. Thanks for being a great audience all. And uh, yeah, hope to visit sometime in person. Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, We've got a beach here, so it's a, it's a little bit nicer <laughs> than the beach in your background right there, right? Yeah.
yeah, exactly. So ho hopefully we can host you soon at some point. So if you're ever in the area, do let us know, okay? Sure, thanks. All right. All right. See you, Ping. Take care.